All right, Supercars is back this weekend. The 25th running of Supercars, the 27th series in which Supercars have contested the ATC, the Australian Touring Car Championships. And Mark Larko Larkham is going to be there. I was going to say with knobs on, but I'll say nuts, bolts, wheels, braces, chassis, roof. Larko, how excited are you? <laughs> About as excited as you, Martin. I, uh, hand on heart, mate, I, I really am. This is a big moment for our sport. And... Uh, we're going to go right back to, mate, in fact, I'm going to go back further than what you said. We started with, uh, you know, touring cars actually in the 50s, I think, was the first ever race in Australia, but the 60s is when the championship started. But Camaro versus Mustang, mate, in the late 60s, early 70s. So, hey, big circle, 60 years later. How cool is that? Gen 3. So explain this to us, and just so that people uh, get it, uh, that this is a brand new cars, and essentially they were bought in, weren't they, to kind of cover costs and even things out? But you'll explain it better. They they were, Martin. There were three primary objectives. One, you know, the, the, the obvious one is there, there is no Falcon anymore. There is no Commodore anymore. So we had to make a decision, where do we go? Now, when Ford closed down, we made the decision to go with Mustang. And with Commodore no longer made, GM was the logical choice. And, and it's great that both those companies have signed up to participate. So we made a set of rules that allowed their body shapes, not the ones we used last year where they cut them up and all the rest of them, but their actual body shapes. So the wind lick surfaces of both the Camaro and the Mustang in Gen 3 are exactly the same as the road car. So we haven't cut them and shut them, which is great news. So that's number one. Number two was, yes, to make it so race teams didn't have to be manufacturing organisations. They could actually be race teams, Martin. So it brings the cost of manufacturing down because now there's so many components. Well, in fact, nearly all the components on the cars, engine and everything, there's a common specification. They're common parts. So we leave the springs and the shocks and roll bars and, and, and camber and caster and all those racing adjustments are still free to play with. So that bit doesn't change. But making wishbones and uprights and bumper bars and engines and all that stuff that costs massive money is now all the same. So that's good news. The minimum... Mate, Sorry, keep going. So, well, mate, and the final one, which is the biggie for your fans and my fans, our fans, fans of the sport, I mean, is we wanted to make the cars more challenging to drive. Not that they weren't already, but like Formula One, over many, many years, we've just ended up putting more and more downforce, aerodynamic downforce on the cars that pushes the rubber into the road and just makes the cars too predictable. So we've taken, check this out, 60% of the downforce off the cars at 200 k's an hour. So that's much more... You know, it's hundred, like at 300 k's an hour, I can tell you Bathurst, when they turn into the chase, they've lost something like 500 kilos of downforce. So that means drivers are going to lock brakes. They're not feeling their tyres as well. They're going to get frustrated. They're going to make mistakes. That's what we wanted. And because the cars aren't so aerodynamically dependent, it should mean, in theory, that you can race closer to the car in front of you because the wake of his airflow is not going to affect the air of your car as much. So it's very much done. Gen 3 is very much about the entertainment value as well. Larko, so just, I mean, there's so many things I, I always have to ask you, mate, and you know what a fan I am of tyre degradation, but I want to, I want to talk about um, the dirty air. Explain that to us, because that's what this is about, the downforce and everything, is it? What exactly is that? Well, it, it's the same as Formula 1 found. You know, so, so as the car's blazing through the air, it creates downforce and it creates drag so drag is like how big is the parachute on the back of it that's trying to hold it up that the engine's got to push through the air so that's one thing and the more downforce you have the more drag you have so the downforce is the other thing so we had an under tray underneath the front of the car that's a bit shaped like a wing and we had a wing on the boot that both those things contributed to hundreds and hundreds of kilograms of downforce so it'd be like I don't know, four sumo wrestlers sitting on your roof at 200 k's an hour, pushing your tyres into the road. Now, the car in front, if you're following around trying to race him, all the air that comes off his wings and his surfaces of his car is what we call dirty air. And dirty air doesn't make downforce. It actually disrupts the car behind it. So the car behind can't use the air efficiently. There's not a lot of energy in dirty air. So it can't use that air to go across its aerodynamic surfaces. 
So by reducing the aerodynamic uh, de dependency of these vehicles, it does two things. They don't make as much dirty air, and the dirty air that they do make doesn't impact the car that's following closely behind because it doesn't need so much downforce anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, look, and, and also, straight away in my mind, I'm asking, in terms of the safety as well, because that is absolutely paramount, how easy is it to control the cars without that extra downforce? Well, that's what we want to see, mate. I mean, we, we've got some of the best touring car drivers in the world. I mean, our, our, our field is actually thick with talent. So you're not going to see guys driving out there and driving off the road and sliding them sideways into corners. That's a, it's not going to change like that, but they will drive to the grip that's available. That's the art of race driving. Like when you're driving wet weather in a race car, you go 10 seconds a lap slower, but you're driving to the grip available. So if we take downforce off them, they will drive to the grip available. But here's the thing, although they've got a lot less grip, and they're going to lock a few more tyres and they're going to, when they're under pressure or someone's attacking them, I reckon they're going to make more mistakes, which is really cool. But they're going to go just about as fast in terms of lap time and certainly just as fast in a straight line. Because although we've taken 50 horsepower off them to make the engines more reliable and to live longer, we've actually given them a little bit more torque. So down low, they'll be a little bit harder to drive off a corner. That's really cool. But the cars are lighter significantly lighter, they're lower, they've got a lower centre of gravity, so all of that means they've recovered the lap time that they lost from the downforce. So we're, we're going to be in the similar realm of speed and lap times. They're not going to look any different, okay. except they're going to look way a lot angrier. Martin, seriously, these cars look cool. Oh, well, this is what we were can't wait for. This is Supercars this weekend in Newcastle. Oh, look, I, you know, I'm fascinated with the um, minutiae of, of, of all of this. Uh, 1,400k uh, down to 1,335 minimum weight, plus also a 95kg uh, minimum of driver and seat combination as well. Is there that much discrepancy, Mark, in terms of the size of the drivers and their own physicalness or I mean and how important is this that you got you're gonna to have to lose some kilos fat boy you know is, is that is that the message <laughs> it's a really good pickup Martin so what happened years ago we had little Max Wilson back in the early 2000s I think Maxie from he drove for me for a while uh, I think Maxie might have weighed about 62 kilos ring and wet uh, and we had some big guys at the other end big tall fellas like Stevie Johnson was probably about six foot bloody three or four and you know, maybe weighed 100 kilos or whatever Stevie weighs. He's, he's a big, tall frame. So that massive disparity, man, that has a huge input. That, that's really critical in terms of lap time. I can give you a calculation what every kilo will cost you in lap time. Wow. So it actually wasn't fair. We didn't want smaller or taller drivers to be disadvantaged. So what they do, Martin, is at the start of the year, they weigh all the drivers and they come up with literally like an average, which is like 95 kilos now. I don't think there'd be a driver in our field now that's over 95 kilos, you know, with their helmet and their hands device and all their bits and pieces. So it's done that way to equalise it. So it is fair. And, and someone that's small doesn't get an advantage and someone that's bigger doesn't get a disadvantage. That's why they do it. Because I'm asking that question because I'm looking at I'm looking at the size of Tanda compared to Mark Scaife and thinking, my God, is you know, is, does it make that much of a difference? And will we never see a guy as tall as, as Garth again, if that's the case? No, well, we will. And one of the things that we, we couldn't do with the last generation of car, they were really restricted in terms of headroom, the way the roll cage was above them. So with these cars now being um, more driver friendly, the, the driver sits um, in a better spot in the car. There's more clearance to the roll cage. So guys as tall as Garth Hander can fit in them without a problem. Okay. But here's the kicker. Martin, it's still in your interest as a driver to lose weight and be extremely fit as these guys are. Because if you can keep your weight down and keep it on that um, 95 kilos, to sure that's all factored in. But the more weight you can take out of anywhere in the car, right, it doesn't matter where it is in the car, that's why teams spend tens of thousands of dollars finding half kilos and kilos, because you've still got to meet a minimum weight of car and driver, but you can carry ballast then to bring yourself up to weight. And then you can put that ballast low in the car. So then you lower your centre of gravity, right? So anything you can do to lower your centre of gravity, 
is a performance advantage. Mark Larkham is with us. A 5.7 litre LTR V8 for the Camaro and a 5.4 litre Coyote V8. It's a dumb question. I feel like it is. But the 0.3 difference, why is there a 0.3 difference and does that make any difference? That's not a dumb question, Mark. That's a very good pickup again, mate. So, okay, so so I said before, one of the key objectives of Gen 3 was uh, the manufacturer relevance, you know, the body styles of the cars. And the other thing we wanted to do so the engines we've been using for many years, yeah, they had a bit of hold in them and a bit of forward in them, but most of the parts on them were made by teams. They were what we call bespoke engines. They really didn't represent anything road going. The engines now actually come from the GM family of engines and the Ford family of engines. That's a Coyote and that's an LTR, as you said. And so what we've done is use a lot of their bits now, their engine blocks. We've got aluminium engine blocks. So, so those, the fundamentals of those engines are what you buy in the road car. Now, yeah, we've hotted them up a bit. Of course we have. But we've had to change the capacities, Martin, to bring them into play so they both make exactly the same power and exactly the same torque from like 4,000 RPM right up to 7,500 RPM. And I'll show you again in the telecast. I might even show you this weekend. The overlays of those graphs, they're perfect, mate. So one's a, a, a quad cam, overhead cam, uh, the Coyote Ford engine, completely different architecture to the Chev engine, which is a more conventional push rod two valve engine. So they've had to change the capacities and a few things on them to make sure they marry up perfectly. I oh, see this is, and this is what you know. I wanted to finish on 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 this, which is you know your graphics package and the work that you do, because there is no one better, I don't believe, in the world of sport that does this better than you. And I'm not peeing in your pocket. And you know that I'm genuine when I say there's a couple of things I love. I love when you superimpose a car on a car and you do this with Bathurst. I hope you bring it into all the tracks where you show where the speed is being made up on what corners. That's absolutely brilliant to watch, okay? What other changes, if any, are going to be with the graphics? And you've got to talk about tyre degradation before you leave me, mate. Oh, Martin, so funny. Well, you know that graphic we did with the... And I want to use it again. You know where that technology came from? No. New Zealand. Right? We had a couple of Kiwis come over. I just forget the name of the business. They're brilliant guys. I think really the America's clever. Cup guys. Yeah, that's right. Those guys, yeah. Yeah, Ian, yeah, dumb. Ian, yeah, Ian, uh, Ian Taylor, probably. Sir Ian, he's brilliant, mate. Yeah, and yeah, we worked with them to, to do that. Now, you know, as is always, you know, funding and costing is always... There's always compromise in the telecast. I'd love to get that back, mate. That was, a, for me, a real feature as well. So, you know, fingers crossed, I'm going to go straight to my boss today and say, hey, Martin Devlin wants this for Bathurst, right? Thank you. No problem. Um, let me leave you with tyre degradation. Yes. I know you love tyre degradation. I love tyre degradation, mate. I love it, mate. I love it. I love it. I love the smell of a tyre degrading. The, um, with this loss of aero, what's going to happen is the tyres are, of course, going to degrade at a faster rate because there's not the aerodynamic downforce pushing them into the ground. So that means that's going to push drivers into a, a strategy corner that's going to compromise them more. So, again, it's going to be more challenging. So, you know, hey, if you didn't love tyre deg before, you can love tyre deg now, right? I love it, mate. I just look. I just to me, it's just it's so relatable, is what it is, and and also all the pit work you guys do is you know don't ever think that what you're doing isn't being noticed because what that package that is provided to watch on the TV is as good as sport actually gets, mate. The racing is something, but what you guys bring around it is is absolutely brilliant. Love you to bits, Larko. Can't wait for race one, mate. Can I just say, mate, the feelings reciprocal. I mean, I just I'm staggered by the love of our game. Uh, from our Kiwi brethren over there and thank you for that because seriously per capita every time I go over there I've said it before mate I reckon you'll love it more than we do here so really can't wait till we get back there sometime